one of the unexpected things about being a fiction writer, unexpected by me at least, has turned out to be how often people want me to write nonfiction. Um, perhaps a comment on my books of some sort, who knows. But uh, as part of promoting books, I'm constantly getting requests to do an essay about um, uh, you know, uh, the book that mattered the most to me when I was growing up, uh, a teacher who said something inspirational, the best advice my mother ever gave me, all, um, all the stuff that I carefully, carefully hide in my fiction people want just baldly on the page. What do you really think of your father? Uh, <laughs> And so this, uh, what I'm going to read is part of that. Uh, Lonely Planet asked me to write an essay about a trip that I took. Um, and this is the first one that came to my mind. The title which they put on it, um, but which I am not, uh, not displeased with, is an Italian education. In 1966, when I was 16 years old, I went on a trip to Italy. This was my first trip to much of anywhere without my parents. It was billed as educational. We would be enrolled at the university for foreigners in the lovely hilltop city of Perugia to learn whatever Italian we could pick up in four weeks. Students from several high schools were participating. My English teacher was coming along with three other girls from my English class, Carolyn, Janice and Ellen, all friends of mine. We students were lodged in a number of places, but on the cheap. My particular cohort of four landed in a convent. We shared a room on the second floor, Spartan but bright, which looked down on the street below. There were bars on our bedroom windows, which we wondered about. <laughs> the nuns did not speak English, and we, despite the dozen or so hours we would eventually put in, did not speak Italian. <laughs> we called the Mother Superior the Hitchcock Nun because she resembled the creepy sort of painting whose eyes follow you about an empty room. Her expression soured visibly whenever she looked at us. The other nuns were friendlier and we had friendlier names for them. Imagine a trip to Italy only with terrible food. Perhaps we ate what the nuns always ate, dry rolls, fatty meats, tasteless cheese, bitter tea. One of the teachers complained every morning that they must be making a pretty penny off of us. She eventually bought her own jam, taking it out of her purse ostentatiously, this jam that they should have provided but didn't. We found the ugly Americanism of this embarrassing, though in fairness to her, the food was truly terrible. I lived those four weeks on bread and water and a daily trip to the gelato stand. So there we were, tucked up in the nunnery, and yet most of my memories of the trip have something to do with sex. <laughs> Not real sex, but the rumor of sex, the specter, the shadow. I was 16 years old. Sex came in all manner of guises. This same teacher, the teacher with the jam, was often in a bad mood about something or other. Our guide, a young man from England, told me one day she was probably going through the change of life. <laughs> he had a girlfriend back home and occasionally asked one or another of the prettier students to model some bit of clothing he was thinking of buying for her. He sang Frank Sinatra songs when we were on the bus, but even this did not diminish his appeal because it was 1966 and all it took to be sexy was to be British. <laughs> The change of life was a phrase and a phase of which I was ignorant. Once explained, it was unwelcome knowledge. <laughs> Someday, I would be in a continual bad mood and young men would find that amusing. <laughs> Yet, I was flattered to be confided in, taken in all the conversation had provided about equal parts pain and pleasure. At orientation, this British guide had warned us about the Italian boys. They were very handsome, he said. As it turned out, some of them were and some of them weren't. But very aggressive. They mustn't be encouraged. We must at all times be demure in our dress and deportment. No pants, no short skirts, no bare arms. 
no makeup, sensible shoes. We were told to be actively unfriendly. <laughs> we four walked to school every morning and went out again on our own after siesta, exploring Perugia's steep, narrow streets and hidden staircases. We made a game of looking for 12 steps, 39 steps. We saw few girls of our age, but many boys to whom we were not friendly. <laughs> they didn't appear to notice. <laughs> Despite the warnings, it was startling to be pinched and prodded. Carolyn was not the oldest of us, that would be me, but she looked the oldest. Blonde and curvy, even in her demure clothes, she was tormented beyond her endurance. One day in a small public square, she turned and slapped a boy across the face. He instantly slapped her back. She began to cry. An old woman appeared, hugged her. Brava, she said, brava. <laughs> she turned to shout at the boy. He shouted back. Red-faced, he gestured furiously at Carolyn. Slowly, a crowd gathered, men shouting at women, women shouting at men. A gender war had broken out. <laughs> Since we could understand none of it, we slipped away while it was still escalating. <laughs> I have no idea how or when it ended. For all I know, they are shouting there still. Another day, an older man, a man about the age of our fathers, came and chased the boys off for us. He spoke good English and was courtly and kind. After that, we often saw him and often talked to him. We felt that we had made an Italian friend. One sunny afternoon on our way home to dinner, we passed him seated at an outdoor cafe. He waved us over, got us chairs. It was soon clear that he was very drunk. He moved closer to Carolyn. He put his arm around her. He put his other hand, he put his other hand in her lap. Something happened under the table. When she jumped up, he spilled his drink down her dress and over my legs. And that was the way we had to go back and face the Hitchcock nun, wet and reeking of alcohol. <laughs> Janice was our resident expert in all matters sexual, the one who had explained the change of life to me. She was the only one of us with a boyfriend back home. She wrote him letters and talked about him endlessly. He was sort of a boyfriend and sort of her piano teacher. <laughs> He was much older and had an actual girlfriend, so their affair had to be conducted in secret. All this seemed adult and sophisticated to me, not a bit sad or unseemly. The fact that it was also illegal interested us not at all, since it carried the suggestion that we were not capable of making the smart choices we were so obviously making. Toward the end of our trip, the university hosted a dance. I could see only two possible outcomes to this. The first was that I wouldn't be asked to dance. The second was that I would. And I didn't see how I could manage it, dancing while being actively unfriendly. Both possibilities made me so anxious that I told my friends I wasn't feeling well and stayed behind at the convent, playing checkers with the nuns. We had a rousing game and I went to bed early. My friends returned around midnight and woke me. A group of boys had followed them back from the dance. They were in the street now, calling up to the open window. I can kiss you. I can kiss you. Several of them made it hand over hand on the columns and cornices to the second floor. They hung there looking in. Their hands came through the bars. They howled at us. The nuns sprang into action. <laughs> Checking first to make sure we were all in our bedroom where we belonged, they armed themselves. Not Catholic myself, I had imagined the nuns would command a certain respect. They did not. We watched from our windows as they attacked the boys with mops and broom handles, trying to knock the ones on the edifice to the ground, to chase the ones on the ground away. In the end, they triumphed, as nuns will do. They came back inside, heads high. How was the dance, I asked my friends. And they said it was good, really fun. I should have come. A few days later, there was a drama involving one of the girls from a different high school. She'd gotten engaged to an Italian boy, our British guide told us. Her parents arrived as quickly as you can fly from California to Italy, possibly quicker, to whisk her home. They had some words with the guide to the effect that he was not supervising us properly. He pointed out that none of the rest of us had gotten engaged, only their daughter. <laughs> It was a standoff. <laughs> After four weeks, we left Perugia, down one student, no more fluent than when we'd arrived. 
There followed a week of travel on the bus. The food improved immeasurably, a great relief as I'd spent all my remaining gelato money on a local artist's rendition of Don Quixote. <laughs> we saw the iconic works of art, the Sistine Chapel, the Pieta. I remember the David best, but mostly because Janice bought a small replica and shipped it off to her boyfriend with a ribald note. The note was very funny, she told me, but she wouldn't read it to me because she said I wouldn't approve. There is nothing more annoying than being told there is a funny joke that you can't hear. How did she know what I would approve of? I was the one who made her whole affair possible, driving her to meet him in out-of-the-way places, lying to everyone about where we were, providing the cover of my own spotless reputation. I felt hard done by. In Florence, we aroused little of the attention we'd gotten in Perugia, in Rome, none at all. Our remaining adventures were less sexual than life-threatening. We were booked home through Shannon Airport on Saturn Airways in a modest four-propeller plane. Janice had the window seat. About 20 minutes out, she turned to me. One of the propellers has stopped, she said. Across the aisle, Carolyn and Ellen were sleeping. Should we tell them, she asked, and we decided we would not. Moments later, the pilot spoke over the intercom. We're returning to Ireland. We've had a little engine trouble, but not to worry. We could get back on a single propeller if we had to. Those on the right side of the plane didn't know a propeller was out on the left. Those of us on the left didn't know that both propellers were out on the right. Plus, the wing was on fire. The pilot continued to talk to us. He was calm and cheerful. The crew behaved less professionally. Perhaps I'm misremembering that we could hear one of the flight attendants throwing up in the bathroom. I'm certain one of them quit on the spot, loudly and publicly. We had a beautiful, smooth landing. When we debarked, the runway was lined with sobbing Irish. They seized us and hugged us. You had the best pilot in the world, they said. They shook their hands heavenward, the best pilot in the world. The best pilot in the world had completely persuaded me that we were in no danger. This was my first understanding otherwise. I turned to watch him come down the stairs. His hands were shaking, his face drained of color. Someone handed him a bottle of whiskey. He stood and drank it right there on the tarmac <laughs> while people cheered him and cried. Again, there were compensations. Cute boy from another high school who'd never said a word to me before asked if I was all right. Saturn Airways was forced to buy us all a lovely supper and put us up for the night. I remember this as one of the most amazing meals of my life, roast chicken, rhubarb pie. We had hotels with feather beds and also this, a whole new plane sent from Germany. We finally arrived in New York in the middle of the great airline strike of 1966. We spent a night at the airport, which was crammed with people sleeping on the chairs and floors. If our parents ever wanted to see us again, they were going to have to pony up for first class. This remains the only time in my life I have ever flown first class, and I slept through the whole thing. <laughs> Janice told me they served frog's legs. But these final adventures, dramatic as they were, are not what I think of first when I remember my trip to Italy. Instead, I remember how it rained every day during siesta, but stopped politely when we wished to go out. I remember the pantomimed amazement of the nuns that we could sleep in the large hair curlers we wore to bed. I remember our British guide singing Strangers in the Night, and our English teacher telling me I should write it all down because I would be a writer someday. I did write it all down. I lost that diary decades ago. And all this is still not what I think of first. The very first thing I remember, and with enormous pleasure, is the great battle at the convent. The boys on the walls, the nuns with their brooms. The four of us watching from above, just 16 years old, and already that epic struggle below waged for us and only us. Thank you, Karen. Um, for, for being here and, um, and for saying nice things that we got to put on the cover of this book. Um, so thank you very much to the, uh, to the bookstore for, for having me. I'm very excited to be here as part of Independent Bookstore Day, um, which is a, a new event and, and very dear to my heart.
All right, so I'm just going to start. I'm going to read from uh, around the middle of the book, and I don't think there. If you have questions, if you're confused towards the middle, just raise your hand, and I can I can clarify things. Um, but I I'm going to just pick something from the middle. Um, I mean, I've, I've checked it before. I didn't just like open to a page. Uh, this chapter is called Anomaly, Season Four. Um, and let me start. After the casual, loosely structured weekend at Cleveland's Hironomicon, Val assumed the role of celebrities at these things was to sit in, a, in an assigned place for a certain amount of time and not much else. But when she arrives at Chicago's McCormick Place Convention Center with Alex in tow, she's handed a booklet titled Windy City Comic Con Talent Code of Conduct and assigned a handler who goes over the code in detail as he whisks her away from the main convention floor and down a side hallway. The important thing, he says, is that we try as much as possible to discourage non-official photography. He is short, balding, and pudgy, with an officious air, a clipboard, and a red windbreaker with WCCC staff emblazoned on the back. Val is beginning to form the thought that he reminds her of the white rabbit when she, when she hears Alex softly singing, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. Moments like this confirm for her that he could be no one's child but hers. Of course, the white rabbit says, complete containment is impossible, but if someone asks to take a picture with you, respectfully decline and suggest they purchase a ticket from for one of the photo ops. Someone will be making the rounds at the signing table selling them. Purchase a ticket, says Val. It's all in your contract, the white rabbit says. Val hasn't read the contract. Everything was set up by Elise, who's in the business of reading contracts, and must have thought this was all perfectly normal. You'll receive 30% of, of net on all ticket sales over and above your flat rate fee. How much are tickets, says Val. Not so she can figure out her cut, but because the entire thing sounds preposterous. Fifty dollars, says the white, rabbits. white rabbit. Fifty dollars, she says, shocked. Listen, I know, all right, says the white rabbit. They've arrived at a door that seems to be their destination, and he takes a moment to give her a patronizing eye roll. Talent always thinks theirs should be higher, he says. But we've been doing this for quite a while, and we put a lot of thought into the price points. Trust me, we'll all make more money with you at 50 than we would at 75. People are going to pay $50 to get their picture taken with, you, with her, asks Alex. Alex is her nine-year-old son, by the way. Uh, the white rabbit nods enthusiastically. We've sold, he checks his clipboard, 83 tickets so far. Alex looks impressed. Being your kid has saved me hundreds of dollars, he says. <laughs> the white rabbit lets them into the room where a trio of photographers and a trio of assistants putter with equipment. Diffused flashbulbs go off at random intervals, and the white rabbit is soon distracted by some other crisis. Val stands somewhat dazed until one of the photographer's assistants grabs her and says, Tori, which is her last name. Uh, yes, she and Alex say simultaneously. The assistant ignores Alex. Stand here, he says, pointing to a spot in front of a backdrop bearing the Anomaly logo, a highly italicized A leaning over a tightly packed sans serif grouping of the remaining letters. Val does as she's told. The assistant runs a light meter over her like a Geiger counter, then barks, two's a go, over his shoulder and flits off. You're a go, Mom, says Alex. For now, Rabbit, she says. Later I'll be a went. He laughs at her little grammar joke. He's in better spirits this morning than he has been. They had borrowed her mother's truck and drove up last night, checking into the hotel near the convention center late. Both of them had been exhausted from the sheer amount of food her mother had compelled them to eat, stuffing them as if they were headed for a food desert rather than the financial district of Chicago. Once they were settled in, there was a feeling they'd return to the path, a place where they knew better how to behave towards each other but there was something forced or off about it. All of her jokes seemed strained, and sometimes she, she could tell he wasn't reading his book, but using it to shield himself from her attention. An older man, well into his 60s, dressed in a red crushed velvet three-piece suit, approaches Val and Alex. Excuse me, miss, he says with a crisp, crisp upper-class British accent, which I will not try to reproduce here. Uh, Might I trouble you? An untied bow tie hangs limply over his neck, and he holds up the useless ends of it in his fingertips. I don't know how to tie one, says Val. He has a great plume of white hair and sparkling blue eyes. His teeth are straight, but his smile is crooked, leaning to the left as if his mouth wants to make room for an absent pipe or cigarette. They're ridiculous, he says, dropping the end, but no one recognizes me if I don't wear it. Give the people what they want and all that. He's the curator, says Alex. He's looking up at the man, wide-eyed. Indeed I am, the man says. You're a little young to have seen my era of the show, though. My friend let me watch some, Alex says. He turns to his mother. The idea man has them all on DVD, shelves and shelves of them. He says you're the best one, he tells the man. Then your friend has excellent taste, the man says. I don't think I know what either of you is talking about, says Val. 
The curator, it's a British TV show, Alex says. He used to be on it. Long before you were born, says the man. Probably before your mother was born as well. Slowly and carefully, he lowers himself to one knee, so he's at eye level with Alex. Would you mind helping me, he says. Sure, says Alex. First cross left over right, says the man. Alex takes the end of the bow tie and crosses them. Then bring that one under and up, and the other gets folded. That's it. Now bring the first one over and through and fold it behind. Now we pull the whole thing tight. There. Val watches as Alex goes through the complex series of movements with surety, then finally pulls the whole thing taut into a perfect bow. And once the bow tie is on, she does recognize the man from afternoon reruns on WTTW on days she was homesick from school, painted fabric sets that occasionally billowed breezily, rubber monster, su monster suits and plots with fever dream logic. So much easier when it's someone else's hands, the man says. Mine shake something awful these days. My jazz hands, my wife calls them. But now we're ready to play wax museum, eh? He smooths out bits of his suit and straightens the tie. You've done these before, Val asks. I hardly do anything else, he says. It seems seven years of playing a beloved hero has made me unqualified to play any other character. I'm familiar, says Val. But is she? She's never tried to go back to television, and in the world of little New York theater, her time as Bethany Frazier has been irrelevant. That's the role that she used to play on a television show. Uh, it certainly hasn't prevented her from getting roles. It even opened certain doors for her. Grant, her, direction, her director on Millennium Approaches, told her once that Valerie Torrey helped, helped the play work, but Bethany Fraser helped it sell tickets. Yours was the American time travel show, the man asks. Anomaly, says Val. Couldn't wrap my head around it, he says, apologetic and not unkind. Audiences in my day required much less science in their science fiction. Whenever we needed to explain something, we'd say particle this or morphogenic that, introduce some machine with Tron at the end of it. The episodes they're doing now, you need to be Stephen Hawking to follow them. They still make the show, Val asks, and the old man laughs. The curator's a British institution, he says, 50 years on Auntie Beeb, which makes me something of a museum piece, I guess. At the far end of the room, the white rabbit has returned. He's leading a line of people, each of them with tickets in hand, and reading another long list of rules off his clipboard. Talent will spend as much time at their table as possible, he says. Please remember that talent like you need time to rest, recharge, eat, etc. So please be respectful of their need to take breaks. Headshots will be available at the table for signing or bring your own item. Cash is the only method of payment accepted. Talent reserves the right to refuse to autograph any item they deem, deem inappropriate. Bootleg merchandise is not allowed. The old man looks at the oncoming crowd wearily. The internet's made Lazarus of, uh, of us old television hacks, he says. Or zombies, perhaps. It feels a little exploitative, doesn't it? Charging people to take a picture with you, says Val. She inspects her outfit, unsure if it's photo op worthy, but it's too late to change now. A little monetary sacrifice at the altar of the television gods. It's all right, the old man says in a grand, airy tone. Pays for the wife and I to pop over once a summer. Our daughter's at University of Chicago. She's getting a doctorate in economics. That's great, says Val, because it's the kind of thing you say when someone's child is getting an advanced degree. <laughs> this from two parents who could never balance a checkbook, he says. You must miss her, says Val, looking at Alex, who is staked at a corner of the room to sit and read in. They don't stay his size forever, you know, says the man. You there, he calls to Alex, who looks up immediately. Stop growing. You'll end up breaking your mother's heart. Alex smiles the way you would at a child who's trying to be cute, and then returns to his book. It's the one thing I liked about the curator, the man says. The idea that every few years he becomes a completely different person, and the audience has to decide whether they like this new person or not. Later, when there is a lull, Alex, Val goes over to the corner and slides down the wall to sit next to Alex. Hey, rabbit, she says. How about that story I owe you? Alex doesn't say anything, but he closes his book and tucks it in his backpack. For a moment, it looks as though he's trying to figure out how to position himself, as if he doesn't know how to listen to a story unless they're curled up in bed. He folds his hands in his lap and looks at her expectantly. Fraser is eight weeks pregnant, she says. This is season four. She hasn't told anyone yet, not even Campbell. Anomaly Division gets called in on a series of couples who claim their pregnancies have been sped up. You know how long a pregnancy is supposed to be? Nine months, says Alex. Some of these are lasting weeks, but the babies are being born perfectly healthy, not premature at all. And once they're born, they're growing up too fast, walking at one month, talking at nine weeks. It's funny, says Val, wandering off the story's path a little, because we all think that, that it's happening too fast, maybe even that something might be wrong. But we think time is passing quicker than it should, not that the child is actually growing up faster than they ought to, even though that's how we say it, they grow up so fast. Looking back, I'm amazed at how Tim nailed that feeling, even though he and Rachel never had kids. It was before you were even around. 
She finds it easy to remember Andrew during the pregnancy. Uh, that's her husband. Uh, she finds it easier to remember Andrew during the pregnancy than to remember herself. He attacked the pregnancy like it was a problem to be solved. He brought home bags of prenatal vitamins, of lotions and creams. He read half a dozen books and took notes on all of them. She'd find post-it notes around the apartment that read folic acid supplements or increased levels of prolactin. She began to feel like the sole patient in an overly specialized hospital, but didn't notice that, that as this went on, Andrew became more interested in the pregnancy than in her. The two became oddly separated. They talked about the varying effects pregnancy could have on a couple's sex life, but never noted the effect it had on theirs, which was to bring it to a mutually and tacitly agreed upon halt. He looked at her now like the mother of his child and touched her gently as if she might break. She was so grateful for his help, his solicitous assistance, that she assumed the physical bond between them would be easily repaired after, later, that it hadn't been severed but only put aside. There were weeks of the pregnancy that stretched out months, she says, or felt like they did, nausea and backache, backaches and constant trips to the bathroom. And then I was huge and I couldn't remember getting huge or being a little big. All the interim states had passed by me before I had time to notice them. And then you were there, she says. He leans in against her, tucking his head into her armpit. There was a moment, that first day at the hospital, when Tim and Rachel had left and Andrew was asleep in the chair in the corner. Val and her baby, whose name they hadn't decided yet, alone for the first time. His heart, which had a day before been inside her, beating next to hers, and she felt as if she was returning to herself after a long time away. Everything will be different now, she remembers thinking, with no idea what would be different or how, whether it would be better or worse. The major difference in those first few weeks was a break from everything outside of herself and Alex, one enforced by the sheer exhaustion resulting from Alex's constant need for attention, for feeding, for holding. Val had continued shooting right up to the day before she went into labor, even though she moved with all the grace of a Zeppelin. Tim and the other writers had come up with a couple Fraser free Fraser-free scripts they'd shoot after the baby was born, and they held off things as long as they could so Andrew could have time away from the set. But a week and a half after Alex was born, Andrew had to go back to shooting, working longer than normal days to make up for the time they'd lost until the longer than normal days became the norm. Each week, Tim would drop by to see Alex and ask Val if she was ready to come back, and each week she said no, not yet. When she saw Andrew, he was usually asleep on the couch as she passed through the kitchen to get water or a snack during one of Alex's brief periods of quiet. When Val and Andrew found time to talk, it was like they were speaking in different languages. Val would report on Alex's moods, digestive issues, minor developmental milestones. Andrew would recount plot details and rumors going around the set. In some ways, she was aware she was making a little world sufficient unto itself, and that she was waiting for Andrew to find his way in. But in those weeks, he became in, even further invested in the show, spending time in the writer's room contributing ideas, bringing home books on multiversal theory and the epistemology of time travel, most of which, most of which would end up dropped by the floor by the couch, barely read. After a month, the attention Alex needed no longer felt constant. And as promised, Tim arranged for a babysitter near enough to the soundstage that Val could check in on Alex between takes. She re-entered the world of anomaly begrudgingly, shocked that nothing else had changed when everything for her was different, as she'd known in that first moment, moment it would be. But once there, she could feel the relief of it, to be lost in someone else's imaginary story, only a thing in his dream. The line is starting to fill in again. The white rabbit makes sure he stays in her field of vision as he paces back and forth, checking the time on his watch on his phone. He can wait. Everyone else can wait. It gets worse, she says. Maybe Tim already knew that, knew that by intuition or by empathy, but I didn't then. In the episode, it's the leader. He's stealing time from them, stealing days and weeks and months to use elsewhere. I look at you and I think that. And whoever done it replaced that little person with a version of you that was even better. They did it over and over again. And every time I was so happy for what I'd been given and so sad for what I'd given up. And every time I knew that I'd be, I'd be losing this one too any second now, the moment I blinked. Thanks.